because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. I'm Alex Epstein. Well, we're right in the middle of the aftermath of the elections. Joe Biden seems to be the new president that's being contested, but that doesn't seem like it's going to work. And so a lot is going to happen in the next several months. And in the realm of energy, a lot of it is going to be bad. I think there are some definite improvements with a Biden administration. That's a whole other topic. But in my realm, the realm of energy and environmental issues, things are definitely going to get worse in terms of what's being advocated for by the dominant people in power. So over the next months, years, there we're going to have a lot of work to do in terms of opposing the wrong policies and at the same time trying to promote better policies, even in a hostile environment. Now, one thing that we can think about is that although there is hostility toward fossil fuels in the US and the idea that the US is going to get off fossil fuels, that is not going to happen in any significant way, or at least not in any way that's nearly as significant as we're told. That is this idea we're going to get off fossil fuels for electricity by 2035. We're going to get off them from everything by 2050. That is not going to happen. That shouldn't reassure us all that much because as we've seen in California, even fairly minor decreases in fossil fuel use coupled with renewable mandates can be very destructive. Uh, but it, it does point to a reality that is not being acknowledged. And that reality is that in general, the world is going to be fossil fuel powered for a long time. And in my view, that reality is a good thing. And maybe the best way of understanding that reality is to understand the international scene. When we're talking about things like CO2 emissions, we always have to remember this is a global issue. And in terms of uh, you know, the US doing things, we have to think about what we're doing, even if it is important to reduce CO2 emissions, which I don't I don't think it is. I believe they have an impact, but I don't believe it's significant enough to merit decreasing energy use uh, at all. But whatever, whether you agree with me on that or not, you have to acknowledge this is a global issue and you have to acknowledge what's going on around the world in terms of energy use. And one of the dominant trends, and I think a very positive trend, is that the less developed countries are using fossil fuels to what I call empower to give themselves the miracle of machine power to make themselves far more productive than they could ever be with manual labor. And one of the great stories of that in the world today is India. And that's one reason why I'm very excited for today's guest. His name is Vijay Jairaj, and he's an independent energy, climate, environment researcher who reached out to me several months ago he has some good articles on different topics. But the thing I was most interested in is that he was born and raised in India. He went to school abroad for a while, but now he's back in India and he's really had a front row seat uh, for the rise of India and how that's been powered by fossil fuels. I, I always love getting the firsthand perspective of people who've witnessed things, who've lived them. And so I think this is going to be very exciting. And in fact, I know it's going to be exciting since I'm recording this after I did the interview, and I certainly got a lot out of the interview, and I hope you do as well. So without further ado, let's see what Vijay Jairaj has to say about fossil fuels and India. I'm joined now by Vijay Jairaj. Vijay, welcome to Power Hour. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for having me on here. Yeah, my pleasure. I've been looking forward to this since I first became aware of you. So let's start out with, because we're going to be asking about your history. Where were you born and, and in what year were you born? Uh, I was born uh, in the late 80s, 1987. And I was born in the southern part of India, uh, not a city, but a rural part of India. So I pretty much grew up here in India. Okay. And so where you live, most of the listeners of this show have never been to India. I've never uh, been to India. What, where you lived in particularly a rural area starting in 1987, what was the state of poverty and related? What was the state of energy where you lived? Uh, the kind of poverty during those times 
was much uh, worse than those images that you see on hollywood movies uh, i would really? make the refer- yeah i would make the reference of the movie slum dog millionaire mm-hmm. uh, so that is the 21st century poverty things were much worse uh, in the previous century and uh, uh, just 50% of people in the entire country had electricity and uh, like majority of the people lived under 6 dollars a day and things were pretty much uh, uh, bleak like you only had employment opportunities uh, in the major cities and uh, farming was not a, a very you know profitable uh, business uh, so yeah it was the poverty was all around and you could see people uh, asking for arms almost everywhere and i know a lot of people who kept kept change changes uh, we call here, rupees here so they had coins uh, in their pockets uh, because they know that the moment they step out of their house they're going to meet someone who will be asking them arms uh, so this was pretty rampant uh, back in the late 80s and 90s and it was only after the 90s that uh, india actually took off economically so i'm curious what it was like just for you so like growing up i mean did you have indoor plumbing uh plumbing is a great question uh even as of today people uh, struggle with it uh we did have plumbing and uh, uh, uh but the problem is we do not have a uh, uh, a pressurized water supply uh um, what it means is that every house needs to have a, a overhead water tank uh that's connected to a motor so only when you uh, turn on the motor to pump the water uh from an underground tank uh, uh you can have water supply in your home so essentially like you cannot rely on your local water supplier uh to pump the water all the way up to your taps so and that meant uh, plenty of people did not have motors or electricity so it was hard and even today some villages uh, they have to uh, use water uh, in big vessels and uh, buckets and that's how they do it uh, but things are far better now back then plumbing was a luxury i would say so were you in a relatively wealthy family uh my family was a uh, 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 middle income family i would say and uh, middle income families were uh, reasonably well to do uh they did not have to uh, go through some of these challenges uh but uh, in the ninth, uh, late 80s a uh, majority of the country was just uh, approaching the middle income line uh so it was tough for the majority of the people in the country but like middle income is not like middle income in us and canada right uh that's right yeah middle income is uh, much more lower here and uh, and like uh the middle income family has to work over a number of decades uh to uh, uh purchase and uh, procure things that a middle income family in in the US could do in a couple of years like what would be some examples uh examples would be uh, uh the cost of houses are very low here but then you have to work uh, over a decade or so uh to you know really think about purchasing a house and back in the 80s it was even more difficult so um other examples would be uh the cost of education uh um i understand that us has a, a very big issue with the cost of education but here it's uh, even worse like if you're from a middle or lower middle class uh many families opt out of uh, making their children uh pursuing Uh, a professional degree like an engineering or a medical degree and that's because they know they cannot afford even the basic fees that the universities ask for and uh, so uh, be it the education be it um uh, your desire to purchase a house or even a car uh, it's very difficult and not only that if you look at every day uh day to day use appliances in the houses uh, even those are uh, uh becoming common only now back in the 80s it was hard for families to have refrigerators uh hard for families to have uh uh heaters 
where they could have a uh, bath in hot water uh, it was hard for them to have even a uh, gas cylinder uh, natural gas for um, like other uh, gas and petroleum as well i would say uh, many families did not have vehicles for transportation and they had to rely on uh, very few uh, public transportation means to travel long distances and all of this meant that it restricted their ability to uh, come up in life economically so things were very bleak but i would say india has come uh, far from where it was back then just to keep i want to just keep exploring a little bit more what it was like in the past what what was sanitation like for for your family but also for poorer families uh sanitation is an issue uh which i'm happy about right now but uh back then uh open defecation was uh very common and uh so that's uh, that in the us you know that's leaving aside the worst parts of san francisco now unfortunately like that's unimaginable uh, yes i like also am, yeah like i, I never saw they, that in uh, my life yeah i think they also have an app that uh shows you the open defecation areas in san francisco so oh. i yeah i was pretty surprised when i visited san francisco in 2016 uh, uh so during the last election so yeah i was surprised because it took me um, brought back memories for me uh, from how india was and uh, even the garbage disposal the solid waste management uh, was very poor uh, Uh, but the last 20 years has been amazing for india uh, india has made a great effort in improving solid waste management uh, liquid waste management and uh, other uh, habitual uh, uh, things like open defecation and all this has been uh, continuously monitored and improved over the past 3 decades yeah um okay a few more things i mean what was the average woman's life like uh you know when you were growing up uh cuz you're mentioning no appliances yeah, or yeah very I, i would say yeah yeah kind of yeah uh in terms of uh uh it is it is one of the reasons that india was so backward that uh a woman is expected to get married at a very early age and uh she does not think about a profession because uh it is expected that she do she does all the house chores uh because uh, if if you take away the most essential appliances if you take away a refrigerator you have to prepare meals every uh every day or every um every time as well because if you see india is a tropical country and you cannot expect food to uh, remain uh, uh without spoiling from morning till evening uh because of the high humidity here as well so uh, that is just with cooking and even for cooking uh, the poor families do not have gas so that meant they have to uh, go in search of firewood uh it was very common and even now it's common and government is taking efforts to reduce that and uh, uh, they wash clothes with their hands uh, for a long time uh, we were fortunate enough to get a washing machine when i was in my grade 6 or so uh, but it was very hard even now uh, people uh, wash with their hands what what was machine. that like to get a washing machine oh uh, it's it's luxury washing machine is a luxury and i'm talking about a, a top loader a old old school type a top mm-hmm. loader uh, and we don't have dryers and of course in india i think clothes dry pretty fast but it's a luxury and uh, even refrigerators were the most basic uh, double door refrigerators or multiple doors were unheard of until recently uh, double doors did make their way but even refrigerator was a luxury tv was a luxury television uh, simple things like iron boxes were a luxury back then uh we didn't have air conditioning wait condition. iron box what's i don't uh, know the term iron box is it like an iron uh is that what the, we call an iron yeah yeah so like ironing your clothes yes yes got it so uh yeah so we would uh, uh typically there would be a iron ironing guy uh, for every locality and houses would give the clothes to them uh for get for getting the job done uh so i can think of every electrical appliances uh, that is very common in india right now was a luxury back then uh and that includes all the things that i mentioned and even vehicles uh people didn't uh it was a luxury to own a, a motorbike 
live alone a car and uh, so so yeah things were very pretty bleak uh one more thing what about so what what about the average man you know where you're growing up in your area like what are what are they do what were they doing in the late 80s early 90s work wise uh with regard to employment uh the situation was uh um uh, Yeah, the situation was uh, not really bad from what i can remember uh, but but that what i mean by that is that people had minimum income to just meet the most basic needs in their life uh, they cannot aspire uh, to move into a upper middle income uh, category or uh, desire to have just normal things uh, just the basic electrical appliances i mentioned so what the employment availability was very limited and uh, it i remember i still remember that in the 1990s that india brought in the uh, f- uh, foreign direct uh, direct investment and that was the game changer with regarding with regard to the uh, ec- employment opportunities that came forward in the next couple of decades so until then like men if you if i can answer your question better like i would say like uh if you graduate there is not a assurance that you would get a job uh, and i'm not talking in ter- in terms of the current scenario which you see in the us i'm talking in terms of uh, uh, there's a question regarding your next meal uh, there's a question regarding how would you pay your rent in the coming month uh, and we are talking about very uh, low rent and very low cost of food and even for that men had to struggle Yeah, I've been thinking as I've been working on my next book about, you know, in a modern what I would call empowered environment. So an environment where we have all this machine power at our disposal, how little time we need to spend to get food. And I had a story when I was in college. I was at Duke University and I ran out of money. Uh my I mean, my parents there you have a meal plan. Uh, at school and I had run out of money and I didn't want to ask my parents for more money. So I tried to figure out how could how do i live as cheaply as possible and so i just had lentils and tuna fish and salad dressing for a while and you know i could live on 20 25 a week us you know and that that's below the average hourly wage so just if you really want to eat if you just want to get to the next meal even pretty healthily you can do it for less than 1 hour of your time a week and if you do it in the us for clean water it's a few seconds a week that it takes and so you just think what an amazing world that is where it takes you an hour to rec- yeah. to acquire your food and clean water and then you compare yeah. that to people living in they might even try 60 80 hours a week and they might not get that quality yeah 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 i think you're right and what you uh, said just uh, reminded me of one more aspect of life back then here in india uh, the uh, the affordability of nutrient food was a luxury as well uh, so meat was a luxury uh, we are talking about most basic meats like uh, chicken and uh, goats or sheep like th- that was a luxury so people did not have nutrition and uh, even the percentage of people who did not have their average days nutrition was very high and so even today i can look around and see so many families uh, they can afford meat only once a week and meat is not expensive here you can get a, a, a highly uh, protein uh, meat like chicken for around 3 dollars or less than 3 dollars but even that is a luxury for many uh, today so they afford it like just once a week so uh, so when you bring in the nutri- nutrition aspect and the aspect that you mentioned that uh, how 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 long a person has to work uh, how long over his life he has to work uh, to be able to achieve the economic success uh, that is, was prevalent in the western hemisphere uh, uh, so that was a big thing and uh, in a way i see sub saharan africa uh, in a position that india used to be once uh, so uh so it, it uh, there is a pattern and i think uh, uh you know what it is because your book talks all about it uh so the 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 use of fossil fuels uh, is critical and uh, and uh, the similarities between india in the 80s and 90s 
and what the sub-Saharan Africa is currently going through and where the Western countries were once. Uh, so all this add up and uh, show us a very clear picture as to what is the reason behind the poverty. And I, I believe that is the access to energy. Yeah, so let's let's talk about the causes of the improvement in India in particular, but obviously there are huge parallels to the improvement everywhere. But I want to start off with you mentioned in passing direct investment. And I think that's something that's very important that I don't talk about in my first book, but I do talk about in my next book. Can you talk about, you said a lot changed when you had direct investment internationally. Could you explain what that was and why it was such a big, why it made such a big difference? Uh yeah, so, so anyone who, uh, who has been studying the Indian economy or uh, how India transitioned from being very poor to the state where it is right now uh, will be aware of the fact that uh, India opened up its shores for foreign direct investments, which means uh, it, it was more of a conservative economy. It was very closed, uh, not allowing foreign investments in uh, the uh, organizations and uh, so many public sectors. Uh, but that changed in the 90s. Uh, the government was very proactive with that, uh, which meant uh, more privatization uh, of the uh, uh, different sectors in the country. Uh, it meant uh, that foreign investors uh, could invest uh, not only with uh, finances, but also with technology uh, uh, in the agricultural sector, uh, in the industrial sector, uh, in the energy sector, uh, and you can name it like it was like a, uh, it was a boom. And this coincided with the uh, evolution of the uh, computer age. And uh, India, uh, because of its advantage of uh, having English as a, uh, a second language, uh, which meant all of us learned English when we grew up, not all, but uh, those who uh, chose to those who chose could uh, choose uh, uh, because uh, the education system was open. Many choose to study English. Uh, others were given an opportunity to still study it if it was not made a primary language for them. Uh, this meant that the workforce in India was capable of uh, catering to the uh, technological needs uh, of uh, US, Canada, and the European countries. And that's why uh, when the compu computer evolution took place, uh, the software uh, inf uh, information technology industry took off in India. And a uh, uh, couple of uh, hubs, couple of cities in India uh, turned into uh, their own uh, Silicon Valleys uh, catering to the uh, information revolution. So this uh, coincided with India's uh, privatization and the uh, influx of a huge uh, foreign investments in all the sectors. So together, uh, couple, coupled, uh, they brought the in Indian economy forward. Uh, but you must also remember uh, that uh, the agricultural sector is key to India. It's still, uh, uh, if you take away the energy sector, the biggest thing is agriculture in India. And uh, there was a couple of key uh, uh, interventions in agriculture sector, uh, such as the introduction of uh, Borlaug's crops, uh, in Norman Borlaug's crops in the 1970s and uh, the use of uh, agricultural technology from Israel uh, in the early 2000s. And all this revolutionized the agriculture sector as well. So uh, the development of the agriculture sector uh, coupled with uh, the foreign direct investment and India's growth as a, a, a silicon hub uh, of the world together uh, made sure that uh, we no, we don't remain uh, in the poverty state for too long and uh, we grow fast and our GDP is one of the fastest growing. Uh, it was the fastest growing since the 90s. Uh, so yeah. So let me see if I under, I'll tell you the way I think about foreign investment and I may not be totally right, but I'm curious what you think. So I think about a lot of it as, you know, what makes a driver of prosperity is that you go from a manual labor civilization to a machine labor civilization. And one of the fast, if, if you're in a world where machine labor already exists, like that technology already exists, modern energy production already exists, the fastest way to get there if you're in a manual labor civilization is to have foreign investors who can bring in machine labor 
invest in it with the idea that, oh, we're going to empower the manual labor. We're going to help them create more value. And then we can profit from that, but they can also have a standard of living themselves. And then that also, I would guess, contributes to the infrastructure because they need infrastructure to power all the machines, but that that infrastructure can then also power domestically originated industries as well as domestic consumption. Is that accurate? Uh, yeah, I would say that's accurate. And uh, the foundation for that is the energy sector. Uh, so um, as you said, uh, when these investors brought in the technology and as the infrastructure grew along with it, you needed a strong energy sector and the energy sector was the key during these phases. And India made sure that the development is uh, has a foundational basis in the energy sector and uh, even now uh, even now uh, let's come back to what's happening with india uh, later but uh, i would say you are right and uh, um, even now when people uh, face uh, electricity uh, outages uh, it impacts it impacts not just their businesses it impacts the entire city and uh, it it brings it brings them back memories of days in which uh, the use of technology and the, uh, you, the availability of infrastructure was very poor and how in, it impacted uh, their life and how they were in a constant state of uh, 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 poverty. Uh, so you're right on that, yeah. So let's then talk about the energy sector. And I'll give you two, I'm gonna, I have two questions and you can decide what order to take them in. Cause I'm interested in, what made you decide to get into this field? But I'm also interested in how did this evolve in India? You said it's this driving force, but how did, you know, what, what happened to make it, that, that led it to evolve? And then how, you know, how has the evolution gone? So I'm interested in both. I don't really care which order you address them in. Yeah, uh, I think I would uh, say why I'm involved in this first, uh, and then I'll take the other question. So, right. yeah, so, um, I, I, I was a lover of nature, uh, which meant that I was naturally inclined towards disciplines of science that were to do with the conservation of nature. And uh, that made me uh, pursue my graduate studies in environmental sciences. And what happened after that was that as I was pursuing uh, the, a career in environment, I realized that uh, uh, humans are playing a primary role uh, in, in shaping the environment, uh, at least the environment that, uh, that are habitable by human beings. So uh, when humans are involved, um, uh, policies are in, involved. So I began working with organizations that uh, dealt with implementation of environmental policies. And uh, those organizations also dealt with energy policies. And energy and the environment are uh, so intricate. So uh, we humans have been deriving our energy uh, from the environment, all natural sources, the fossil fuels, all, all the way along. So uh, it, it naturally led me uh, to uh, research and involve myself more in the energy sector because it's so uh, deeply connected with the environment. And what, there was a lot going on regarding climate change uh, because climate change came right in between these two. And it said, our use of energy was impacting the environment. The energy use is destroying the environment. And I happened to study at University of East Anglia, which was, uh, which is still uh, one of the key universities for uh, climate research. Uh, so uh, I was naturally interested in, in, in I would say, how, how all these three met. And uh, so that's why I, I began to spend more time uh, on research about the energy sector, especially uh, those in the developing countries, because developing countries uh, uh, are very sensitive uh, to how their energy sector performs. And so I would say that is a kind of uh, the path that I took uh, to where I am right now, where I research upon uh, energy, environment, and climate change. So yeah, that would be- well, 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 well. Well, a few things about that. So you mentioned University yeah, okay. of East Anglia. I mean, that's the center of climate gate, right? What they uh, call yeah, climate gate yeah. in 2009, I believe. Yes. When there was a and that, yeah. So can yeah. you just talk about that and were you around for that? Yeah, uh, that's, that was uh, 
I mean, uh, it was pretty strange that looking back now, it happened in the, exactly the same year uh, when I did my master's there uh, and in the same department, environmental science. And I've been to the climatic research unit uh, because my professors were there. And uh, so, the, so uh, just to, uh, for we viewers who do not understand what climate gate was, uh, in 2009, uh, email exchanges between a couple of scientists uh, were leaked or stolen. Uh, and, and they, uh, they uh, look like uh, uh, the scientists uh, were trying to exaggerate the warming that is happening right now, the global warming that is happening right now, to be precise, the increase in temperature during the recent decades. So this was known as a climate gate scandal. Uh, and I happened to be around in the university at the same time. And uh, this was, uh, and I did not realize how, uh, how coincidental it was until uh, later in the mid 2000, I would say 2015 around that time that how big it was like when I was there. Uh, so so uh, that also impacted in the way I saw uh, uh, how climate change issue is impacting uh, the energy sectors and uh, the environmental policies. And uh, I, if I, I want to take a moment to address one more issue and uh, that, that would be that even despite India growing so fast in the previous three decades, uh, uh, poverty, extreme poverty is still there. And uh, some of the latest reports indicate that in 2020, uh, 150 million people uh, are living in extreme poverty in India. And that would be almost like half the population of US. And that's uh, so less than $2 a day, right? Extreme uh, poverty. Yes, yes. Uh, so, and uh, a, cu a couple of uh, million, uh, I would say around 15 million is the mark I read, uh, were added to that extreme category because of the lockdowns that happened this year. Uh, so, I've been to the slums uh, in northern part of India, and I uh, talked to people there. I, I, I've been inside their houses, and they don't have any electrical appliances except for the free uh, uh, radio or stuff like that. And uh, they live just next to uh, gutters and sewage, black colored sewage uh, rivers. And so, um, the if these people are going to uh, gonna come up in life, uh, they need uh, uh, energy. They need uh, efficient use of energy. They need electrical appliances. And that is connected to the overall economy. And uh, so when I, when I was uh, studying uh, my master's and was, uh, became aware of the climate gate scandal, I understood that when, when you uh, suffocate developing economies with stringent and restrictive energy policies, it has a huge impact. And when you have in person met these people who are in extreme poverty, and uh, there is no way a, a, a normal person would be okay uh, with uh, international policies uh, from people who are not elected by the people of a particular developing country, enforcing their uh, energy laws upon them, and forcing them to delay in making these people come out of extreme poverty. So that really interested me. and. Uh, that led me to research. And I think that I would answer your second question, which was uh, how did this energy revolution uh, take place in India? And uh, my answer would be uh, uh, more and more of coal, coal production, coal consumption. India increased uh, its coal uh, fleet. Uh, 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 we, we nearly produced uh, 1 billion tons of coal this uh, 2019, in 2019. Uh, and uh, we are looking forward to produce more and more coal. And uh, not just that, I grew up in the southern part of India and India invested in the nuclear energy as well. And we had some, uh, a couple of huge reactors uh, in my state and uh, uh, additional reactors in those plants are still under construction. So they're expanding uh, nuclear power as well. And uh, in India's monsoon is erratic. So that meant uh, even though we developed hydropower, hydropower uh, we did not uh, entirely rely upon that because there would be years when the waters would go dry and we cannot rely on that to uh, give us a sustained output. 
and uh, so india invested uh, simultaneously in all these uh, different energy sectors and uh, was able to pull through in the past three decades and uh, make no mistake it is coal and anyone from the west would know how the west is uh, how the coal played a central role role in uh, the west development over the past century and every uh, advanced uh, 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 technology uh, uh, the quality of life that uh, the europeans and the americans enjoy today is from coal and oil and uh, they cannot deny that and uh, to expect developing countries uh, to uh, take a different route uh, would will be like uh, uh, chaotic like we cannot do that as i explained it delays our uh, poverty elevation more and more uh, people will remain in the extreme poverty category and uh, it, despite uh, having uh, such energy sources uh, you can see that a simple lockdown can push so many into extreme poverty not just poverty so the people who are in the poverty under the poverty line or just above it uh, are, are uh, in a very precarious situation uh, anything uh, wrong with the economy or the energy sector can immediately push them back uh, below the poverty line and even into extreme poverty uh, so so that's why the energy sector was important and uh, it has been a policy of the indian government uh, to continuously invest uh, in coal and not just in uh, domestic coal uh, india's coal is uh, uh, is not of a high quality uh, the steel plants require high quality coking coal and uh, so we import a lot of coal as well uh, we constantly break or record record coal outputs each year but despite that we also import a lot from australia and recently we have made a partnership with uh, russia to import coking coal and uh, experts say that in the future the imports of high quality coal will keep increasing in india where they begin to substitute uh, the low quality coal that is domestically available more and more uh, so that uh, that is one of the central reasons why our energy sector came up and uh, the other issue was that uh, 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 most of our villages were uh, devoid of electricity they did not have access to electricity they were not connected to the grid uh, so on, uh, only in, in the year 2018 india indian government was able to achieve grid connectivity to every village now that does not mean that every house is connected to the grid it just means that every village in india around 600,000 of them are connected to the grid now uh, but still there are a lot of households uh, estimates vary between uh, 200 million to 300 million people who do not still have access to electricity and those that do have even in big cities like delhi mumbai and chennai even the big cities uh, people face constant blackouts uh, due to uh, uh, the lack of proper uh, transmission equipments and uh, uh, the lack of uh, grid connectivity so so yes we are improving uh, but as i uh, reiterated uh, the reason for india's uh, energy revolution was uh, increased dependence on fossil fuels and uh, uh, constant effort at improving grid connectivity and the transmission lines yeah so how did you so i mean you reached out to me on twitter i think some months ago and sent me some articles and you have similar views to me in terms of fossil fuels are good and and you know the the benefits versus the side effects of fossil fuels including the relative benefits of fossil fuels compared to the so-called renewables that i call unreliables but you were at a mainstream institution university of east anglia i mean it you know, was the climate gate place this isn't some right wing type place or some pro capitalism type place so how did i'm curious how you first how you got your views that fossil fuels are essential going forward because you must have been hearing the idea that oh we can do just as well or better with solar and wind yeah uh, so i would take some time to explain that uh, so even though i was from rural part of india uh, my state in india was one of the first to uh, invest in renewable energy so we had wind farms mushrooming all over our village and our cities over in my state uh, so i had an exposure and understanding that uh, that there is wind energy out there 
but i did not know uh, the extent to which wind energy and solar energy have been adopted in the west until i uh, came over to the west and uh, began studying and we as a part of my uh, training at uh, university of east anglia we even did a uh, ei environmental impact assessment of a wind farm a local wind farm so it kind of gradually exposed me to the uh, renewable energy sector that they were existent um uh, and i i was uh, pretty much neutral like i didn't have have uh, i did not support fossil i did not support renewables uh, for me all that mattered was i wanted to protect the environment and i want people to develop economically and i understood that energy sector is key part of it so having a clean mind uh, helped me uh, uh, just take the good things out of the university of east anglia where i studied and uh, uh, after i graduated as i researched more and more upon this issue uh, i was able to have a, a a state of mind where i was not necessarily influenced uh, by either the left wing or the right wing for me it was all about uh, energy and uh, does the use of energy impact the climate system and uh, how much it's destroying our environment uh, so i assessed everything uh, objectively and it had nothing to do with influences of different people uh, so that's how i developed my understanding and uh, i was able to stay clear of the influences of the mainstream media and uh, going green was a big thing uh, when i was studying my masters and uh, over the past two decades it's 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 become a huge thing going green uh, saying no to fossils uh, so all this uh, mainstream media ideas did not impact me uh neither did the idea of of the extreme right wing which said that there was no climate change you know so uh having studied at an institution which is at the forefront uh of the climate change issue uh helped me uh, stay clear of you know both the sides of things so my answer to your question would be uh, the reason uh why i con i contacted uh people like you is that like uh like um uh, some of people understand what is happening with our climate system some of the people understand uh, what has been the basis of human civilization for the past couple of centuries and why we are at a stage like we've never been before um if you take a, a global life expectancy uh fossil fuels have been number one reason for changing that and coming back to your questions like india had a life expectancy rate of just around 50 when i was born and today it is 83 so when you are born you are expected to live up to the age of 83 back then it was just 50 and if you go back like before a century it was much much lower in the developing countries and it's still low in africa but efforts are being done so yes uh, so for me uh, uh, the reason that i stayed uh, clear of uh, extreme wing influences helped me to approach the issue objectively and understand the reality that uh, use of fossil fuels is not affecting the climate uh, in a in a catastrophic way as they say it is doing that's really interesting so what i'm curious just uh what convinced you when you were studying the data that these claims about renewables rapidly able to replace fossil fuels were untrue oh with regard to renewables uh, uh it it started with personal experience so when i uh, left uh, when i finished my masters and when i began to understand about climate debt and all this i was also hearing from my friends in uh, near my hometown who owned industries and their industries were connected to wind farms and uh, he is a supporter my friend was a supporter of uh, green energy and all this but increasingly he found out that the wind farm the output was unreliable the electricity generated from there was intermittent and it impacted uh, his industrial equipments uh, the technology that he was using his and, sorry his what uh, he he owned a local industry mm-hmm. uh, a couple of industries uh, uh, an industry that produced uh, coconut oil an industry that uh, uh, was there for producing uh, cotton yarns uh, so what happened is that the output from these wind farms 
damage his equipments and that was what i heard oh, his from equip- him equip equipment right yeah yeah equipment. oh sorry, sorry. Your pronunciation i i just that no i that's the first word yeah. i haven't been able to get okay his equipment yeah. got it oh it damaged so, the, okay that's terrible yeah yeah so so uh, uh so that uh, uh was a uh, opening for me uh i was not aware of the fact that wind and solar are, are intermittent that they are unreliable i was not aware, aware of the fact uh and so that made me uh, research more into it and i found out that uh, uh globally that's been the case and uh, so the only way governments in in europe and the americas are able to cope up with uh, the unreliable nature of uh, wind and solar is that they substitute uh, uh, the lack of energy from these uh, renewables uh, with energy from conventional sources like fossil so what happens is that uh, uh, solar does not produce electricity during night and uh, wind does not produce when there is no wind and uh, pe- uh, except for the peak wind season uh in different geographical regions uh one cannot predict uh, or estimate uh, as to whether there will be any wind or if there is wind how much of it uh so it's very unreliable and uh, people say uh, uh that uh, you can have a lot of wind and uh, that will do away with this problem but that's not going to do away when there is no wind there is no wind and uh, so so the unreliable nature of uh, wind and solar was the first thing that i discovered uh, when i researched upon this but then later on uh, i came to understand that the, there are uh, much worse uh, aspects to wind and solar than just unreliability uh, for instance i did my uh, masters thesis uh, in portugal and i uh, uh, my thesis was on bird uh, bird mortality uh, from collisions so i did it on uh, um, uh, electrical fences uh, but others were doing it on wind windmills so wind turbines are notorious for killing birds and uh, and i'm surprised when people say that uh, birds are also killed by cats and high rise buildings and all those uh, but none of the environmentalists are concerned about those environment hardcore bird conservationists are concerned about the uh, killing of birds by the wind turbines and i have written extensively on this and i i witnessed that myself uh, during my master thesis in in one of the special protected area for birds uh, they call it a special protected area but they have wind farms in that and that's the most ironic thing because <laughs> wind farms kill raptors and like i can see it buzzards eagles uh, and like i've written extensively on it and people can look up on it and uh, and so that was the second thing that i understood about uh, wind farms uh, i'm not sure about solar killing birds as of now uh, uh, but the third most important thing is uh, people claim that wind and solar are clean uh, but they are not uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, toxic uh, elements that are involved during the manufacturing stage uh, it it would hardly take people uh, 30 minutes to 60 minutes uh to find out uh the impact of uh, uh solar and wind manufacturing uh on on the local environments uh, uh in china which is one of the biggest manufacturer uh, or exporters of rare earth uh materials that are required in the construction of uh, wind and solar and uh, and also like um, you, there is very less uh, end of life use for wind turbines and uh, i think you might be aware of the mass graves of for uh, wind turbines yeah. they just bury it uh, so uh, the very notion that wind is clean uh, is wrong and they are not going to stop climate change as well like uh, like uh, we can, that's a whole different aspect but renewables are not uh, impacting climate change in any way maybe uh, minuscule insignificant that has nothing to do with the constant increase in global average temperatures over the past two centuries ever since we left the little ice age uh, there has been a very gradual increase in global temperatures uh, nothing dangerous about it nothing catastrophic about it uh, they talk about it they tell us it's coming but they never show us and uh, the only way they say it's coming is is through models and if i may take a time i can 
uh, let your viewers know that um, the most recent analysis of the most recent models that the United Nations is using to predict future temperatures are false by a large margin. They are faulty by a large margin. So the entire uh, premise of promoting renewables as clean and green energy is contingent upon this singular factor that the models have projected a catastrophic increase in temperatures for the future. But again and again, uh, scientists have found out that these models exaggerate warming by a large margin. And they know this by applying these models uh, to the temperature, uh, temperature increase in the previous two decades. And they know how they exaggerate. And uh, if, you, if you can, if you can uh, look at the Paris Climate Agreement for a moment, uh, the entire uh, agreement is based on this premise that there is a catastrophic increase in warming. And that is the only reason they want to substitute fossil fuels, which they think is increasing the uh, warming rate by a large margin, which is again a totally different issue, which again they are false by uh, false uh, in their in their uh, assumptions. Uh, to come back to this, the Paris Agreement uh, uh, requires countries to move away from fossil fuels and implement more and more of renewables, and that is contingent upon the fact that uh, renewables can help us from climate change, which again is false because of the models exager exaggerate uh, the warming. And there is no proof that renewables can uh, do the job in reducing whatever little warming we have right now. Uh, so the, the notion that we, the humans can somehow control um, major climatic uh, trends uh, is a false notion. and. Uh, if our contribution to climate has been very uh, insignificant during the past two centuries, there's no reason to believe that our uh, ability to control the climate will be significant in the years or decades coming ahead. So uh, this is why uh, uh, India, uh, because of the challenges faced uh, by the poverty here and the need to increase its energy use, uh, India in its, uh, in its Paris Agreement was very clear that they would not be compromising on fossil development. So they don't want to keep investing in coal. Uh, I know everybody is aware that India is investing huge in renewable energy, but according to reports and even government reports, uh, even if India goes ahead much above its promised uh, installation of wind and solar, it will still be dependent upon coal uh, for 40, more than 40% of its energy needs in 2047. In the year 2047, India would rely uh, on fossil fuels by more than 42% to be specific on coal for its energy needs, even if it invests heavily in renewables, wasting all the money into the unreliable and intermittent renewables. All right, that's that's a lot of ground covered, and so some of it um, maybe we can discuss more sometime. But I want to turn finally to to you. So obviously you've had this really interesting journey. You've learned a lot. What are you doing now, and what are you trying to do going forward? Uh, as I've been telling you, like one of my passions is to uh, protect the environment, and for me, environment is inclusive of humans. So I don't exclude humans from the environment. So uh, uh, alleviating poverty is one of my uh, uh, import, important uh, goal. And uh, so what I'm trying to do is help think tanks and uh, uh, organizations that are involved in the research and policy dissemination uh, regarding uh, the inter interjunction of climate change, environment, and energy, thereby uh, helping more and more countries and uh, organizations become aware of uh, the reality regarding energy and climate change. And uh, this will only help in uh, helping the, the uh, elevation of poverty in developing countries. And we haven't even talked about Africa and South America, which are very far behind. And there's a lot that needs to be done. So my future plans are to constantly engage in research uh, and contribute with uh, 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 policy uh, guidelines uh, for think tanks and organizations 
so that uh, they would be better equipped to inform policy makers uh, elsewhere so that is one of the things that i'm uh, really uh, interested and excited about and i i am also planning to uh, come up with a couple of reports uh, i work i'm i'm currently working on an energy report on india which might come out soon uh, i'm also planning to uh, inform a larger audience regarding this whole issue uh, from a developing country perspective uh I, i i want i want to let the uh, audience in the west uh, know what it's like uh, for the developing countries when they see the whole uh, climate change issue and the whole uh, um, restrictive energy uh, policy uh, that the un is enforcing upon them so that, that is one of my uh, short term goals uh, yeah so so uh, yeah i want to the last thing i really want to pursue just quickly but maybe we could talk more about it later i just think there's this huge opportunity for the developing world to be a very vocal spokesman about the need for fossil fuels going forward there's a credibility when it comes from you when it comes from people who are in a difficult situation i mean it's there's credi- there's some credibility coming from me in that i know the facts but imagine we had a very vocal presence from india from sub saharan africa from other places saying hey look fossil fuels are making our lives better we're going to use more of them going forward not less i think the the uh what i would call anti human environmental elites in the west would have a lot of trouble with that so how can we like how can we amplify that message and get i mean i think it's a combination of getting the right messengers which obviously you could be one of them and then getting the right message and amplifying it uh yeah i think uh one of the ways to do that is uh identify uh, uh voices uh, uh and people uh, in developing countries uh i would say more so from uh, africa and southeast asia uh and also from south america yeah so so uh Uh, one of the uh, one of the starting points could be uh, i'm looking at this in a uh, in, in a different perspective as well uh, this uh, also requires i think the those people in the west uh, to contact their local uh, political representatives and uh, make them aware of this whole situation uh, that how fossil fuel is helping and to help uh, western countries stay uh, steer clear of uh, restrictive energy policies so i i i want that also to happen uh, at the same time i want uh, uh, organizations uh, that uh, are uh, preaching the truth regarding uh, climate change and energy for them to utilize the voices in the in the developing countries and uh, uh, i would also uh, be interested if organization they reach out to organizations here uh, that are looking uh, in helping economies stay clear of this whole climate change energy mix mixes yeah okay well i want to i we got to wrap up now but i want to pursue this more in the future and for in, for uh, listeners who are interested in either you know get, having you help them with research or some other form of consulting or or talking with you about how to promote this message from the developing world how do they contact you um uh, yeah uh, they can contact me uh, uh through my email and uh, i will leave my email with you you can put it okay but say it out loud too just in case people oh okay yeah listening. uh my email would be consult vijay it starts with a k uh so it's k o n s u l t v j v i j a y at @gmail.com yeah so k o n s u l t v i j a y at gmail.com yeah that's right yeah uh all right that's cool i might have some research for you and hopefully uh others have some as well and i i definitely want to see what i can do to get this voice from the developing world amplified so vj thanks for coming on the show and let's definitely stay in touch thank you alex for having me it was fun yeah thanks again to vj jayaraj for joining me i learned a lot i hope you did as well just one note before i wrap up the show and this is going back to the american scene now i think one of the keys to success in the next couple of years is going to be that any pro energy pro freedom 
elected officials really use the highest quality talking points and messaging that they can get. And I believe that's mostly present at energytalkingpoints.com. So uh, as usual, I'll recommend that you look at that and that you recommend it to people. But I also wanted to say I am very strongly considering starting a weekly or biweekly call just for elected officials, where in addition to giving them the general points on energytalkingpoints.com, I help them with the specific messaging needs that they have that week. And because there are so many important battles coming up, I think this could be really helpful. When I was when I did work with specific candidates and gave them specific tailored messaging uh, leading up to the election, they found it very helpful. So I'd like to do more of that going forward. So if you are an elected official, work for an elected official. And for now, it's going to be uh, Congress, Senate, White House. If anyone of the new White House wants to come and learn about energy freedom, that's great. And also any of the governor's offices. So for now, no state uh, Congress and Senate, although I'll probably expand it to that at some point soon. But if, if you are in any of those positions or know anyone in any of those positions and you want to get on the energy talking points call and get custom messaging, just reach out to me, alex at alexepstein.com, and I will keep you posted on that. I'm probably, if, if I get enough interest, I'm going to start this soon. There's not going to be any uh, charge for it. I, I never charge for anything I do for government officials, but you just have to be really motivated and think that you're going to get value out of it. All right. Well, I shared my email for this specific thing, but also if you have any questions, comments, love mail or hate mail, email me, same address, alex at alexepstein.com. Let's see what else is going on. Newsletter, make sure to subscribe if you're not already, alexepsteinlist.com. You can follow me on LinkedIn where I've been doing a lot lately, as well as Twitter, twitter.com slash alexepstein. And there's one thing that I was going to say, but uh, forgot. Well, as I'm forgetting that one, I will say, I haven't asked this in a while, but if you like this show, I hope you leave uh, ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts in particular. I never ask for that, but I hear that that's very good in terms of promoting podcasts. So I'd like this one to be more widely listened to. And then if you're on YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube page at youtube.com slash improve the planet. All right. Well, whatever I forgot, it can't be all that important. So just as a, as a final note, I'll say to those of you who are accelerators of my work, uh, the, you can learn more about that at industrialprogress.com slash accelerate. I really appreciate uh, the support you've given to my projects, including energytalkingpoints.com, including the new fossil fuels book. And I really hope to have an exciting announcement about that book in the next week or two, but there are some ongoing negotiations about it. And I don't want to say anything before those are over. So stay tuned for that. Uh, stay tuned for next week. Not sure who the guest will be, but I'm sure he or she will be very, very interesting. So until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour. The antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.